Okay. Uh, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians um, in Nebraska and across the country, anywhere. Um, we are free and open to anyone to um, attend. Uh, we do these sessions live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, um, and they are recorded, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always watch any of our recorded sessions on our archive page on our Encompass Live website that I'll show you later. Um, and we cover anything um, that may be of interest to librarians. Um, any topics, that we do presentations, interviews, book reviews, little mini training sessions, whatever. If it's related to libraries, we'll put it on the shelf pretty much. <laughs> Um, and we have commission staff, our own Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do sessions, and we bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have this morning with us. Um, sitting next to me here is Karen Keir, who is from the um, Nebraska State Historical Society, and this is part three, as you can see, um, the third and final part of our series, um, her series on digital preservation. Um, there are two previous sessions done on February 6th and February 20th. They are both done through Encompass Live and recorded and on our website now, so you can go back and watch those recordings if you want to. Um, the PowerPoint slides are there, handouts that she put together are there um, with more resources that you can use. And today is our final wrap-up of this series, um, part three, about manage and, manage and provide modules of doing this. So um, this session will also be recorded course as it is now. The PowerPoint will be made available and handouts that she's put together will also be put up for this one as well. So you have the whole series that you can go and watch um, and learn everything you need to know. <laughs> right. um, but I'll just hand over to Karen now. You can take over. Um, I want to thank everybody three. for um, welcome everybody to our final session of um, the digital preservation uh, series. This is what we're going to talk about manage and provide today and what that means for digital preservation. Um, I am Karen Keir. Uh, I'm the photograph curator at the Nebraska State Historical Society. Um, and as part of my job duties there, I am in charge of our digital imaging lab um, and developing the policies to manage that and provide access to those um, images that we are creating in our digital imaging lab. Um, so this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart and uh, I'll try to cover as much as possible today. Um, and I want to thank the Nebraska Library Commission for allowing us this opportunity to do this uh, series of webinars um, on the importance of digital preservation and about how to care, how to create a plan for manage and protect your digital content. Uh, so today, there we go. Yep. <laughs> Today we're going to talk uh, um, about Depot and what that is and how it was developed to um, mo how how the um, how the Library of Congress developed this a, a model to help gu help guide museums, libraries, and other heritage institutions um, on the preservation of digital content. We'll discuss how uh, digital co content has been um, how to manage and identify how to manage and um, provide access to your digital content um, and what those good practices are. Um, what the, what the uh, de depot is, oops, did I skip over one? There we go. Um, this is all part of uh, the Heritage Net, uh, Husker Heritage Network that um, the Nebraska State Historical Society is um, putting together. Uh, we will have some more training opportunities coming in 2013 and 2014, thanks to a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, staff and volunteers of libraries, museums, and archives will be able to learn more about uh, digital pre um, preparedness planning, care of paper materials, and more, um, and more through on-site and online training like this webinar. More information is to come. Um, but in the interim, please visit uh, the Nebraska State Historical Society's website, as well as the Nebraska Saving Nebraska Treasures website. Last summer, I attended um, the Library of Congress's Digital Preservation Outreach, Outreach and Education Training the Trainer Workshop in Indianapolis. Um, it was a three and a half day training program, and you had to apply to get in. There was 21 attendees from 13 Midwestern states. 
The idea was that we would be trained by the um, Library of Congress's trainers and that we, we would come back to our states, to our home states, and teach at least one of the mod modules um, within six months of completing the training. So that's what we're doing today is I'm completing the final two modules of, of the training. The second, um, this was the second train the trainer workshop and I think there's been another one since then. So there are, should be trainers throughout the country and I think if you go to the web, the, the uh, depot's website which is provided in the link on the resources page you can um, learn more about that as well. <coughs> The Depot's mission is to encourage people to think about what we can accomplish and foster a network of individuals and organizations working together to actively preserve their digital content. So what is digital preservation? Well, it's the active management of digital content over time to um, ensure its ongoing access. Um, once a physical item has been digitized or a digital item has been created, you don't, you can't just put it on a shelf and expect it in 50 years from now we can um, still access it. Um, we need to keep, uh, we need to be able to manage the upgrades in technology as things go, as, um, as uh, technology goes obsolete or software goes obsolete, we need to be able to um, continue to access that. So digital preservation is all about that, ensuring that we can access to digital items that we create um, now throughout time. Um, in the previous webinars, we talked about how to identify your digital content through um, an inventory and how to use that inventory to select the uh, content that should be preserved and managed over time. Um, in the last session, we talked about issues with long-term storage and how to protect them from both minor and major today disasters. Today we're going to talk about um, creating pr um, provisions for long-term management and the types of considerations that there are for long-term access. Here's a diagram um, of how these modules relate. Identify and select are in the center and all else builds on them. Note that each of these steps repeat over and over as time goes on as new material and new material comes in. Identification selection for preservation are ongoing processes. Once selected, the content must be stored adequately. It must be protected from disasters, corruptions, and inappropriate access. And the content must be managed. Um, and this includes policies and procedures, funding and funding issues, and even and more, which we'll talk about today. And of course, the whole point of all this digital preservation is to provide long-term access to that content. As hardware and software and file formats change, the, manage, the method of providing access and the concerns um, to be weighed must be considered. <coughs> so let's talk about um, manage. And what I mean when I use the term manage is really is planning. Planning to be able to tie your organization into the goals and access you, the skills of your organization um, that would need that you will need to make a successful program. Planning to be able to um, also access the technology technological needs of your digital preservation program, and planning planning so that finally planning so that you have the resources like funding and staff to support a suitable digital preservation program. Management is important because of the complexity of um, complexity and ongoing nature of the problem before us. We're facing rapid um, we are facing rapid obsolescence of both hardware and software. Fragile media um, on which are, and, and the fragile media on which our content is stored, and co complex practical issues ranging from access and legal restrictions to migration and emulsion of that content. Not only that, the amount of uh, types of content that um, are both growing rapidly, uh, the types of content are also growing rapidly. But we have not yet even clarified the roles and responsibilities for managing those materials. In 1996, the Commission on Preservation and Access um, and, the research of and the Research Libraries Group published a um, seminal report um, t entitled Preservation, Preserving Digital Information. 
and um, there'll be a link for that on our resources mm -hmm. page as well. Yeah. Um, this report will identify many of the issues before us in digital preservation and provided examples of preserving content um, from the 1960s on. In clarifying the problem before us, the authors laid the groundwork uh, for shared understanding and collaborative support for the development of common practices that have begun to emerge since its publications. Good management um, should be balanced, um, and we often talk about this three-legged stool. Organizations must focus on technology, uh, technological concerns to the exclusions of other parts. Our organizations may fo focus, I'm sorry, Organizations may focus on technological concerns um, to the exclusion of the other parts of the programs that need to uh, that need attention and contribute to a good program. Preservation planning includes not only technological aspects but also organize, organizational accesses, uh, organizational aspects, and resources. Um, organizational requirements will include such things as policy development, planning, training, and legal issues. Technical aspects um, include efforts to avoid file format obsolescence, preparing for new and unfamiliar digital co uh, content types, monitoring any tech technology that could improve or inhibit preservation, um, addressing higher levels of technology issues such as object pack packaging, uh, documenting and preserving relationships at that file, object, uh, and collection levels, and repository level t um, technologies. Resources such as designating funding and necessary staff, um, necessary staff and equipment are cru crucial to sustainability. For long-term management of digital content to be effective, it must reflect holistic and sustained efforts to ensure the longevity of digital content. Since 2003, digital preservation management workshops have used this model of the three-legged stool uh, that encourages the use using all three aspects, the three legs of the stool, to develop um, a well-informed, sustainable, sustainable digital um, preservation program. This module has op like, is often called the three-legged stool for digital preservation. Um, and again, the the website link there should be on our resource pages. If it's not, we can always add it too. So let's talk about um, skills. Skills needed in digital preservation um, are many. And, um, and what we are addressing are the essentials of the program planning, implementation, and sustainability for long-term management of the digital content. Some of these skills are needed all the time, such as project managers and metadata, metadata management. Um, some of them are needed periodically, such as legal and marketing expertise. Um, the skills not available on your team at present may be available through a network and collabor collaborations with others. Think about uh, what you need here and what you um, already have. Begin to think about what collaborations May bring, you may need to build um, to fill in the gaps so that uh, to fill in the gaps of the things that your staff is the uh, the skills that you may be lacking in your staff, um, and we can better address the digital preservation I issues in our region. Um, at an organizational level, here are some of the skills that might contribute to a successful digital um, preservation program. Um, this is. This is the organizational leg. Um, policy development, we'll talk more about that specifically when we uh, talk about policy development in a moment and why it's important. Um, and as, let's see, sorry. Uh, as all of you are project managers, you know that you need to have somebody who um, is assigned roles, guide staffs to manage, manage projects from start to finish. So you might also need somebody who is um, skilled in repository and software management pro and programming um, so that you can, and we'll talk more about this later as well. Um, somebody on your team who is a metadata expert is always good. And again, like I said before, legal expertise in marketing um, might be something you only use occasionally. Um, but there might be other skills, too, that are specific to your organization or your um, digital content. 
why develop policies at all? Well, let's um, spend a bit time spend a bit of time talking about the benefits to developing policy risk related to your digital preservation program. Um, it specifies institutional commitment, and not just a commitment, but I would look at this as a promise. Um, it is our fundamental documentation upon which we articulate how we will develop and sustain a principled and transparent uh, digital preservation program. The process and results of the um, developing the digital pol um, preservation policy is as it is ha um, policy has primary and secondary benefits for the organization. No organization should start from scratch with this. Several libraries and universities have shared their policies online, like the um, ICPSR website um, at the University of Michigan, uh, to serve as role models and examples as you develop your own policies and procedures. Developing your policy, policies will identify issues and challenges, raise awareness, help you define roles and responsibilities, and will build your um, digital preservation team. Additionally, this process will help you clarify um, our roles in institutional commitment, compliance with recognized standards, and will ensure that everybody involved knows what to expect. Other benefits include developing policy will help you build um, your digital preservation team, um, another benefit to having a policy is that you can determine compliance, um, compliance or meet requirements um, as you undergo an audit. Um, in the museum field, we often talk about um, uh, accreditation. Stating in, um, stating in your policy is that we will do this and we will not do this manages ex expectations to your stake stakeholders. You cannot um, preserve anything, everything. You cannot preserve everything. So having a policy means that you can um, point back to say, this is out of our scope. Having a policy will help you identify issues and challenges, uh, as well as raise awareness. There are some organizations that have made their um, preservation policies and documents available on the web. So um, this is where Google becomes our friend. Mm -hmm. With regards to technology, organizations um, need to periodically review and make decisions about their technologies that will help them preserve digital content, um, like computers and servers, software tools and utilities, um, repository and repository software packages. The process should be systematic and intentional. Documenting the process and its outcomes may make the next time easier. Weighing options against requirements should be part of this process. Outsourcing to service providers is increasingly an option and um, decisions should be thoughtful as um, processes to buy and implement technology. Technology changes and organizations can plan to keep up with it, reflecting their resources and um, requirements. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Technology issues are usually the first area of digital preservation management that most people think of, and it is one of the legs of the stool, stool one of the stool of balance management, one of the legs of the stool of the balance, balance management. Um, it is obviously necessary for preservation, for digital preservation management. This will include both hardware and software, and you need to make sure that um, the correct decisions about technology. Um, that you are making the correct decisions about technology that you are going to invest in. When selecting software, it helps to have a guide for what, um, what you are looking for and what to avoid. Remember that technology preservation is an ongoing process, so that it will be necessary uh, to think ahead to ensure it's um, going to be usable for some time to come. Software should be um, modular in design, supporting batch processing and workflows, and should be um, sustained. There should be sustained support. I'm not going to make any specific recommendations because I think everybody needs to find what is going to fit best for their institution. Yes, that's going to be very personal. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. um, but this is just an idea of how to go about maybe looking for some key points, what um, is going to be best 
to, to find in that software that's going to work best for your institution. So here's a question. What did you look um, at that helped you choose the software product? Um, it does not matter what it is, security antivirus or um, a library management system. There are some of these characteristics that will help you decide what software products will work for your institution. Um, and it doesn't really matter what type of software it is. Uh, if the software does not have these characteristics, you should consider that a cue, a clue, a clue, I just found a typo, um, a red flag that um, there may be a weakness in that software that may negatively impact your in ex, um, institution. The third leg of the, re of the stool is resources. This includes issues um, like the ones listed on this slide, staffing, uh, like staffing, making sure that you have the people that you um, make sure that the, you have the people that have or will learn the skills necessary to run your program, whether it be just one or two or a large staff. Equipment. Obviously, you will um, need the core com uh, the core computer and related equipment to process, store, present, and access your collection. Um, but do not forget that you will also need things like desks, chairs, tables, and other um, regular office equipment. Plus, you will have to have a place for everybody and everything. Um, in many cases, equipment and facilities are shared with other um, established functions with, of your institution. Um, but you need to think about how this is going to be accomplished. Um, Succession planning. You should consider that uh, what what should happen to your digital content if your program should um, come to an end due to institutional changes, loss of mandate, or, or loss of funding. You do not want your collection to just disappear. Institutional knowledge. You need to document the process, choices, and decisions that have been made um, when you establish and run your program so that future staff um, will not have to guess why. This is kind of that, if I was hit by a bus tomorrow effect. Mm -hmm. And of course, funding. Nothing happens without funding. Identifying funding um, for digital preservation can be challenging, but uh, any program, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> any program in an organization needs sustained funding to develop and, to develop and grow. We already know that administrators don't want to talk about this because they already have so much on their plate. Managing today's demands and cutbacks may seem a far more important to them than providing long-term access to digital content. Here's where we need to make, take some lessons from our records managers and build a case for why um, this is important. What is the loss of the what loss to the institution if your digital content can no longer be um, accessed or used? How much money went into developing that content, including staffing resources and expertise? Documenting the value to the institution and to the targeted user the user audience will help you build a case and convince your administrators um, that it is important to protect their investment. Now that um, now that one key to um, continuation continuation of libraries is the management of unique special collections and research, safeguarding that this content becomes critical to the future of the institution. So build your case and get your administration on board. Since that 1996 report I mentioned on preservation dig, preserve, preserving digital information. So, Several standards have emerged um, to form the basis of good practices. Two of these are about the requirements for building and maintaining uh, trusted digital repositories. One, the um, OAIS, the OASIS, sorry, um, reference model is a conceptual overview of how preservation systems should ideally work. One, the preservation meta, preservation metadata um, implementation, implementation strategies seek to identify which metadata is crucial versus simply helpful for managing your uh, digital content long term. Standards um, still are still being developed, still evolving and emerging. The important thing is to use these ad, as guideposts. 
map out where you are in relation to them, and identify what you can and should implement. Oops, okay, there we go. Since that um, uh, DPI um, for in 1996, the Digital Preservation Community now has a foundation of standards um, on the basis of good support, and these are commonly cited. If you're not sure what to do, these are great. These best practices exist and are uh, are open up and open up a common language among institutional repositories. Um, so here are just a few um, that you might be interested in or looking into. The attributes, uh, these attributes of a trusted digital repository have been used since 2002 by organizations to gu guide um, the support of their digital preservation programs. There's a lot here and the audit and certification process is um, clarifying for many just how far we have yet to go. To be develop and maintain a um, trusted digital repository is huge and costly commitment. It, it, and it requires strong collaboration. In January of 2007, seven, representatives from four preservation organizations convened at the Center for Research Libraries in Chicago to seek um, a consensus on core criteria for digital preservation repositories to guide further in, um, international um, efforts on auditing and um, clarifying repositories. These organizations were the Digital um, Digital Curation Center in the UK, the Digital Preservation of Europe, um, Nestor, which is in Germany, and the Center for Research Libraries here in North America. The attendees identified that they what they believed were the ten basic characteristics of digital preservation repositories. Um, I believe that these are a good place to start. The first two expectations um, are that the organization is capable of fulfilling its commitment and it does so. It has, it is effective and efficient and it has effective and efficient policies. Digital content um, it selects is based on its commitment and capabilities. How many of us have documented our stated criteria for digital comment, content and will commit to the managing those long term. The institution commits to managing, um, another one is that the institution commits to managing and the, integ in the integrity, authority, and usability of its digital content. Um, some of this may be managed via metadata, collecting the information needed before preservation. How is that content used? How is it accessed? How is it produced? And then tracking those act actions um, on the digital uh, tracking those actions on the digital objects um, during preservation. For example, um, have you migrated a file from one format to another? Uh, how will you track that when you do? Since most formats are obsolete within five to ten years, this is something you need to think about and plan for. Your institution serves as uh, your institution serves a particular community or um, particular community or communities. Who is your identified audience? At um, at our institution, the Nebraska State Historical Society, um, our audience is um, our faculty, students, secondary researchers um, from outside of our institution. Um, is your institution? Um, committed to maintaining the digital content needed for by your designated community. Um, another of the ten principles is the dissemination requirements. Dissemin dissemination requirements means generating accessible, usable derivatives out of your pre um, preserved digital content. Remember that software and hardware keep changing. Um, we may need to be able to uh, continually monitor what formats our users are using and what software will deliver those files uh, to them in a format that they can use. When we need to be able to, uh, and then we need to be able to implement those changes as time goes on. Number nine 
is what we are talking about um, implementing right now. We all need a strategic program um, for the preservation, planning, and action. I honestly think that this is the first thing that um, many of us need to address. The last but not least, we um, need to have technical infrastructure that can support, um, main, can support maintain maintenance, security, and access to our digital, hand, digital objects. Again, this may well be a collaborative um, development to which we all contribute as we are able. <laughs> Planning for digital um, preservation is uh, not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing process, part of digital manage, uh, ongoing part of um, maintaining digital content over time. Preservation planning involves overkill, overall planning um, for the program and identifying strate strategies for preservation, um, preserving the specific kinds of digital content um, an organization is preserving. Every organization should do a self-assessment, update the results periodically, and at some point form a, include a formal audit of your program, um, perhaps by working with peer organizations. Having an outside viewpoint um, helps highlight things that we take for granted and forget to document and clarify. Preservation requires a show me, not a trust me approach. Um, an organization needs to demonstrate that it is following good practices. The outcome of this planning will be to clarify what digital preservation policies and procedures you're going to um, are going to be for your organization. Everything I'm presenting has to be applied in context to you, your own resources, limitations, staffing capabilities, and level of commitment to protecting your investment and providing long-term access to your precious digital content. All right, so finally we're going to move on to the Provide Act module. So let's move on to think about the entire purpose of all of this digital preservation. What's the point of all the hard work and effort? Why the reason the the reason we're even thinking about it is because we want to provide access to the content over time, not just now. Ongoing preservation pro programs carry the digital content across generations of technology to make that content usable and understandable to current and future users. Access delivery systems um, use cutting edge cutting edge technology to help content um, available. Make, help make content available in the most expedient ways using the latest technology available at any point in time. Preservation systems are different. They use pro, um, proven, reliable, and even stodgy technologies to make sure digital content remains readable and understandable to, future, to the future. So if you try to make one system do both, preservation and access will suffer. Um, you can tune a single system to do what to do both preservation and access, and you can develop preservation and access systems to work side by side over time. With preservation to um, to care for objects and access systems to deliver them efficiently. Long-term access needs to be planned, attention in planned intentionally and well managed. Think about some of the issues you've encountered with planning access to digital content outside your, usually, your usual delivery system. For example, you have content available through um, o, o, um, OAI or a shared portal. You may have noticed that you forgot to provide enough content in the metadata for your researcher to know enough to use the digital I, to know enough to use the digital item. This is very similar. Uh, only we need to think about providing access to content outside of the context of our current hardware and software, software and staffing. If we um, preserve our digital content efficiently, at some point it will be accessed long after you and I are still working um, at these institutions. You can, however, lay down the policies for how content should be made available. 
This will ensure that we create documentation functionality that um, will be needed to provide access to and um, usage of our digital content in the future. Policies make consistent, sustainable access possible over time. Um, ad hoc decisions do not. Access and preservation should work side by side. Preservation takes long -term access, makes long-term access part possible in partnership with um, access services. Uh, good practice requires transparency, clear, well-defined, well-documented decisions. Managing rights, um, preservation, privacy, and intellectual property from um, as close to creation as possible throughout the life cycle will make it easier to preserve and provide digital content. Uh, waiting to address um, issue, uh, rights issues until you want to provide content increases the possibility you will encounter legal barriers. Acquiring preservation rights, um, the, copy, the right to copy and transfer the digital co content um, to be able to preserve it over time, uh, at the time of acquisition, creation, or deposit will make it providing content um, over time easier. Think about um, your access policies for users. This is, particular, partic this is particularly at ish issue with copyrighted content, redacted or restricted material, and the databases which may have personal information included. Do you have uh, different categories with different restrictions? If so, how do you handle that? How do you manage um, exceptions and special requests? And how do users request and get access, or do they? Where do you keep this documentation and who should see it? Policies need to exist um, in written form and be implemented. Clarify what the requirements are for access and also what um, you expect in terms of, what, uh, in terms of the accessed, uh, accessed item. For example, if the textual content of a material is, more significant, is the most significant aspect of it, then your preservation system should produce access to the text in whatever, new for, whatever the new format is. However, if the image content of the material is more, is more significant, then your policy should be that your access object will, be, um, will provide access to the image in the new format. Remember that software and hardware will keep changing and discovering delivery methods must be monitored. You will need to keep um, your finger on the pulse of who the users are and how they need to use and access your content over time. Policies will need to change to reflect the needs that emerge and the preservation systems and procedures should incorporate, it, incorporate the um, stated policies. <clears throat> People um, in smaller institutions often wear many hats. The roles discussed here may be performed by um, a small set of people, uh, but the skills associated with those roles are important. When wearing many hats, periodically check, check, hat, um, check the hat you do or should have on. Um, think about in what ways we need to collabor collaborate cross-institutionally to meet um, some of these requirements. As we move forward, forward, we should lay the groundwork for building the foundation um, we need for long-term preservation, and ideally this is a collaborative effort. Together we are far more capable and far more viable, <coughs> um, particularly when we have a shared vision and goal. Um, as noted, in, um, the challenge for long-term uh, long access is planning for future users. What will they want? What will they need? What technologies will they be using? Once you identify your targeted audience, plan for how you will stay in touch and how you will need, uh, need to, how they will need to access and use your digital content. Think about implementing periodic, sur periodic surveys and other method methods for feedback. Um, ensuring a handshake from one generation of technology 
um, to make the next make uh, makes it possible to move content, digital content, into future and un, uh, into a future that is unknown to us at the present. Well, copyright is um, the legal issue we often worry most about and talk the most about. It is not the only legal issue digital preservation um, may raise. There are many other legal issues that may emerge throughout the digital throughout the life cycle of digital preservation, such as restrictions, privacy, and even HIPAA. Um, by keeping detailed documentation and managing these issues before they arrive, you will have <laughs> will better manage your digital um, uh, collections. Um, and also, never be afraid to ask for advice. <coughs> I keep going the wrong direction here. <laughs> um, management of digital content is doable, even without a law degree. And it's important to make um, connections to uh, somebody who can legally advise you from time to time, you may have content which you are legally mandated to preserve. You may also have content for which you do not have legal rights for, for even duplication or to provide access to. Understanding your content is key, as is documenting and preserving your decisions and any right statements which may impact or can uh, impact what can and cannot, or even what must be done with your digital content. To provide, uh, to prepare, be prepared to seek legal advice and follow it. Um, issues will emerge um, regarding access and preservation over time. Okay. In short, to develop an effective and sustainable digital preservation program, you need to understand um, and be able to communicate the value of the content you want to preserve. Why should an administrator care? Um, talk to them in terms of what would be lost if the di digital preservation a digital it loss of digital preservation is not implemented. Identify the stakeholders. Do researchers care about your digital content? Do departments at your university de um, depend on the use of your content in its teaching classes? Do donors want to ensure that what they have donated can be accessed and used for years and years to come? Um, involve stakeholders in um, building your case. Figure out what the benefits are for providing long-term access. Does your donor want his um, grandchildren be, to be able to see his document? Will researchers 100 years from now need this material to be able to uh, study culture for this time period? How much of your institution invested in developing your um, digital program and how much intellectual capability is represented in by your institutional repository. Think about clarifying what the benefits are um, to protect your institution uh, investment and the benefits of the uh, benefits in the future that will be reaped by continuing to provide access to your visible material. The desired outcome for addressing access at this point will be to help build support for our preservation program as well as to clarify what the results will be. You need to clear, um, need clear access policies and a comprehensible understanding of the links that must be maintained between preservation and access. It's important to realize that we will need to be able to provide usable versions of our digital content over time. And that form of those um, versions will continually change. Um, we need to clarify rights issues from the, uh, the point of creation or deposits. And we need to know what we can do and cannot do with our digital material. OK. So um, this is just the wrap up slides. In the session, we've, um, in session, one, we covered the first two of the depot modules, which were um, also the first of the depot's baseline principles. Identify your digital content within your uh, realm and select what you will try to preserve. These um, steps establish a basis for, scope, um, for the scope of the work ahead. Um, until you know what you are committed to storing and managing, you really can't make 
us make a solid step forward. In our second session on um, April, um, March, uh, February 14th, uh, addressed the issues that are that continue that considered the long-term um, storage, both in terms um, that how of what should be stored and how it should be stored. Once it's stored, we need to take measurements measures to protect our content from disaster and inappropriate access. Yeah. Okay. Today we focus our manage, uh, management issues for long term for the long term in consideration considerations for providing access to your content well into the future. Uh, we need to develop and review our plans, develop and implement policies, and lay the groundwork for sustainable long term um, for a sustainable long term program. After all, the whole point of digital preservation is to provide long term access, and that will need. To, and that will, that will need to change continually to meet the current needs of our targeted users. For our work um, to, to, sustain, um, to be sustained and be sustainable, we need to lay the groundwork, plan ahead, and establish the policies and procedures, collaborations, and funding to make um, it all possible. So where do we go from here? Well, take a few minutes to think about your current situation. Jot down two or three things you think you most need to do. For each one of you, think about who you might work with um, within your organizations or somewhere else. What challenges might you face? How much time um, is, um, is this likely to take? What will, and what will be the outcomes? After you think about these, think about um, think about these things. I want you to pick up which one to start with. Pick which one you're going to start with. Take a few minutes to think about this, and then uh, we'll take questions and wrap up. Here's a link to a few more um, websites for the Internet um, Inter University Consortium for Political and Social Research. They have. Um, Publish their digital preservation policy standards and roles and responsibilities and more. Um, this is a very useful role model and maybe one you want to pattern, pattern your own um, policies after. Cornell University is a very um, useful online tutorial and survey for uh, institutional readiness. Also, Depot has prepared a list of links and um, additional, additional resources for each of the six modules. <coughs> All right. So thank you for joining me for these webinars, and um, we can take some questions. Sure. Great. Thank you, Karen. Um, lots of information there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was nice to have the wrap up there, the first two, in case anyone didn't um, attend those or watch those recordings yet. So you can get a little, little brief introduction to that. So if anybody has any questions or comments or anything you want to um, ask of Karen or share, um, type it into the questions section of your interface. The go to webinar interface, and I've got the questions coming in here. We can share. We can share them. Um, the links that were that she showed in the PowerPoint um, will be added to the recording page afterwards. As usual here um, at Encompass Live, we put all of our links to that are related to any of our shows into our delicious account, so people can access them. I've been working on some um, right now while well, we've been here. <laughs> I've the slides, um, but more will be added. Um, there's some handouts that she did that are Word documents that will be added as well and the links from there. And then anything that was in this PowerPoint will also be there along with the PowerPoint itself. Um, oh, we do have a request to please go back to the Identify Next, step, next Steps slide. Is that the one you're looking for, Jen? And again, yes. um, all of the slides are going to be on that same website. Mm -hmm. So if you yeah. want to go back and review any of the slides or any of the steps, um, you can do that as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, everything will be added there. Does anybody have any questions about any of it? It's hard to come up with questions. I know it's all <laughs> a lot of information. It's all kind of overwhelming when you start thinking about your, mm -hmm. what your own institution needs to do. All right. I think it's a lot of it is the kind of thing that you take it back, you absorb it, discuss <laughs> with other people, like you're saying, find your team, figure mm -hmm. out who's going to do what and how you're going to get all of these things taken care of. And there may be some of these parts you've done, too, like in mm -hmm. bits and pieces that you don't realize are part of this whole process and you yeah. need to fill in around it. 
Well, it doesn't look like anything really urgent is coming in right now while we've been chatting. So um, I think we will wrap it up. Um, on the last slide, uh, Karen, did I think you had your contact information I did. on there. Yeah. Right. So um, definitely contact her with any questions you do have afterwards as you're getting involved with it. She can help get you through this. That mm -hmm. was the idea of going to this training, the train the trainer aspect of it. Yes. And, and then the nice thing about it is, is if I can't find the answer for you, we have a whole network across the um, community, across the country, mm -hmm. um, with experts in the field who um, maybe I can't answer, but they definitely could. And we have a great listserv that um, the trainers mm -hmm. have a listserv that we can access. Mm -hmm. So if you have, you know, questions, Karen could be like your main contact here in our area and then Absolutely. reach out to anyone else who might be able to help you out. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I think that will wrap it up then. Nobody's got anything they're rushing to tell you right now. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So thank you very much, Karen. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, this is great. we got this nice three-part series going here. Now we'll have all the recordings up together, so you'll be able to watch them one after another. And um, from the beginning, in case you didn't get to see them all, and we'll have a nice little series here that people can use as a reference. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, um, that will wrap it up for today's show, um, but I hope you'll join us next week when we are going to have library commission staff with us, so it will be our own thing here, um, talking about the Nebraska um, Legislators Database. This is a database that was put together by staff here at the commission where you can search um, past and present legislators in um, Nebraska. Um, so, any, so if you're interested in that kind of thing, what's going on with the legislature, um, this would be a great session to attend and see how you can research all this. Um, going back, um, we've got 1857, so it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, I've seen a quick demo of it myself, and it's very in-depth and a lot of neat information you can find out about all of our uh, the history of le the legislature in Nebraska. So hopefully you'll join us for that next week. Um, register for that and come join us. Also, we are on Facebook, so if you are a Facebook user, you can um, like us, like Encompass Live, and we post here updates to sessions, um, announcements of when the recordings are ready, um, any new episodes that are coming up, so you'll be able to keep up with what we're doing here as well if you do follow us on Facebook. So other than that, I think we're all good. Nobody has typed anything else since while I've been talking here. So uh, thank you very much, and we will see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.